In the 4,600 million years since the Earth was formed, our planet has undergone huge changes. Some we know about, others we can only speculate over. But in the late 20th century, there is one ancient event which has increasingly taken on a great significance in the modern scientific community and led to some very fierce debate. Just why did the dinosaurs die out? Was it a deadly virus, a climatic change, new predators, or most spectacular of all, a catastrophic meteor strike? For many years, the popular view of dinosaurs held by the man in the street was that they somehow became extinct because man evolved to take their place. For most of this century, public awareness of prehistory was almost non-existent, and the study of dinosaurs was a relatively obscure and unpublicized branch of science. The meeting between men and dinosaurs is a nice, fun idea for filmmakers, and one which has often inspired the type of encounter which we have just seen. Of course, Hollywood has never allowed the facts to get in the way of a good story, and long may it continue to do so. Well, like most modern animals, dinosaurs lived in specific places in specific times. For instance, Tyrannosaurus rex was only around for a few million years at the very end of the Cretaceous, and so was Triceratops. And in the beds right below that, we get a whole new set of dinosaurs. And the area where we're sitting right now is the end of the Jurassic, where you get uh, Allosaurus, Brachiosaurus, uh, Diplodocus, and that's 70 million years away from Tyrannosaurus rex. And if you go back in time another 70 million years, that's where you get uh, Coelophysis and Plateosaurus. And certain dinosaurs only lived in certain areas. For instance, Triceratops and Tyrannosaurus rex are only from the Western North America continents. Uh, there's no evidence that those two animals ever got outside of that area. It's disappointing for students of horror and fantasy, but dinosaurs and man never walk the face of the earth together. But then, when we consider how fierce a predator Tyrannosaurus rex may have been, maybe it's just as well. Everyone knows that dinosaurs lived very long ago in time, but you would have to go back a very long way indeed to meet with one. In fact, you'd have to go back 65 million years before the first man walked the surface of the Earth to find a dinosaur. It's notoriously difficult for us to gain a perspective on the passage of time especially a passage of time as long as this. But to help us locate the dinosaurs in their era relative to ours, we need to go right back to the very dawn of time. At the very beginning, the Earth was just a big cloud of red-hot gas slowly cooling in space. That was 4,600 million years ago. For the next 200 million years, not much happened, except the cloud of gases cooled further and slowly coalesced to form the planet Earth. As the planet cooled, the first seas were formed around 4,000 million years ago, but Earth was still a barren and empty ball of rock and still devoid of life. Then, 3,000 million years ago, a miracle happened and the very first simple life forms appeared in the prehistoric oceans. They were very simple indeed, algae, plankton and bacteria, but it was life, and it was from these humble organisms that all subsequent life would evolve. This was the Archean Age. As yet, life was confined to the seas. The land masses were still in a state of flux due to the constant eruptions of thousands of volcanoes. A typical landscape of the Proterozoic Age, 1,000 million years ago, would have looked like this. Even though the land was devoid of life, 
In the oceans, the process of evolution was by now well underway. By 430 million years ago, we had reached the Silurian Age, the age of the fishes. Some of the life forms which evolved at this period would look remarkably similar to the sharks in our modern ocean. With the continents now ready to support life, the first sophisticated plants and insects began to appear. Then the first amphibians crept out of the oceans. This was the Devonian Age, 370 million years ago. There then followed a period of some 135 million years, which scientists know as the Carboniferous and Permian Ages, the age of the amphibians and reptiles, during which the first reptiles came to inhabit the entire surface of the Earth. From 245 million years ago until 65 million years ago came the age of the dinosaurs. This period, the Mesozoic era, is subdivided into three main parts. The Triassic, which saw the evolution of the first dinosaurs, the Jurassic, which saw them develop into the enormous life forms such as the huge sauropods shown here, and finally, the Cretaceous period, which saw the huge carnivorous dinosaurs such as Tyrannosaurus roam the Earth. They, along with the plant-eating Triceratops, were among the very last dinosaurs to exist before the final extinction of all dinosaur species 66 million years ago. The popular perception of evolution assumes that the first small mammals evolved at this time followed by larger forms. In fact, small mammals had coexisted with the dinosaurs for at least 160 million years. Well, mammals and dinosaurs are found uh, together in a lot of quarries, especially Como Bluff. That's a famous mammal locality as well as a dinosaur locality. And dinosaurs and mammals, you know, appeared in the fossil record at the same time. As for dinosaurs being sort of the sole representative of monsters of the past, if you went back to the Mesozoic, you'd find that dinosaurs only made up less than 10% of the fauna because there were reptiles in the sea, there were flying reptiles, there were lots of other animals that lived on land alongside the dinosaurs. There were also crocodiles and turtles and lizards at that time as well. So although they were ecologically dominant and size dominant, they were not numerically dominant as far as numbers of species were concerned. Mammal fossils dating back to the Triassic period are regularly discovered, but they are mainly small rodent-like creatures akin to shrews and mice, nothing like man. If you look back at the late Triassic period, of around about 220 million years ago, you find that there are actually the remains of the very first mammals. And uh, just so happen to have a few here. These are the remains of um, the small teeth of very small Triassic mammals that are found in South Wales, in this country. And these minute teeth, with little spiky ridges on, uh, were ideal for, for snapping up the bodies of insects, uh, just like shrews are today. Now these animals were living alongside the earliest dinosaurs. So we can tell because of the, the bones and the teeth of the animals that are preserved at the time, that mammals arrived on Earth at about the same time as the dinosaurs and coexisted with them while the dinosaurs seemed to rule much of the ecosystems on Earth. For man, we have to wait another 62 million years before we discover anything even vaguely resembling a human being and the true Homo sapien does not appear until a mere 100,000 years ago, 65 million years after the last dinosaur had met its doom. All the uh, mammals that we find during the age of dinosaurs are pretty much all smaller than a cat, and there are many different kinds of groups, but they're never dominant in any one fauna, and they never took over any of the niches occupied by dinosaurs while the dinosaurs were around. Mammals seem to have survived as small creatures, not because they were small, simply um, the, the interpretation seemed to be that the mammals were able to fit into an ecological niche that left them able to live at night, when it was relatively cool, as shrew-like creatures, snapping of insects and living a relatively insignificant existence, while during the daylight hours the, 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 the dominant animals were dinosaurs and their relatives. The evidence for much of what we now consider to be the truth about the dinosaurs comes from the fossil record. Many people assume that fossils are simply the bones of dinosaurs which have survived in the earth. With the enormous spans of time which we are dealing with, even bones are generated and return to nothing. A fossil is even more remarkable than mere bones. In order for dinosaur remains to survive the huge journey through time, 
In most cases, the bones themselves have to be almost literally turned to stone. That is essentially what a fossil is. For this to happen, conditions had to be just right. When a dinosaur died, provided its remains were not scattered or consumed by scavengers, to become fossilised, the remains would have to be covered by a sediment of some kind. Otherwise, the carcass would disappear in the open air in the natural way. Fossilisation effectively stops the natural process of decay and preserves remains forever. Well, when we prepare down to the layers where the bones are, usually you'll find a little bed where the rocks will either change colour or sediment size. And then when you flip this over, you'll see the bone. And as soon as the bone is exposed, you have to put glue on it. Keep it intact, otherwise it'll start disintegrating immediately. So we prepare a little, glue a little, wait a little, prepare a little, glue a little, and wait a little. And eventually, after a time, we get the whole bone exposed. Once covered by sediment, the dinosaur remains are compressed and altered by the minerals in the sediment over thousands of years until the sediment becomes new rock. The bones then become a mineralised part of the rock. Often the chemical composition of the bones themselves is altered to match the surrounding rock. This, uh, this particular bone looks like um, a bit of a vertebrae, but we really can't tell right yet until we get it back to the lab. These look like transverse processes, but this is an odd bit of bone here. It doesn't look symmetrical, which, uh, which is something you'd expect in a vertebrae. So. We're just going to take good care of it and, and jacket it up and get it back to the lab and uh, then try and try and figure out what the hell we have here. In this condition, the fossil remains lie buried for millions of years until the natural geological movements of the earth and the effects of weathering bring the rocks back to the surface, exposing the fossil to the outside world once again. Well, North America traditionally has had the best sites because they've been the best explored and they're very accessible and widespread over the western United States. But Argentina has some fabulous finds and it's pretty much conceded that Mongolia has the best pickings because they have the, the best preservation in the loosest sands. So you could just pick it up, you know, scrape away a little bit and you've got yourself a complete skull. So China, Argentina, um, are the two best countries other than the United States and, of course, Canada. They have Dinosaur Provincial Park, which has some fabulous finds there. The 4,000 species of mammals which inhabit the surface of the Earth today are by and large concentrated in specific geographic areas. Elephants are only found in Africa and India, buffalo in America, pumas in South America and so on. But many dinosaur species are found all over the surface of the Earth. Why should this be? Once again, the answer stems from the staggering span of time which separates us from the dinosaurs. The familiar pattern of the continents and the surface of the Earth looks to us to be, well, set in stone, as it were. But in 240 million years, a lot of things can change, including the position of the continents themselves. Although they are moving so slowly that we cannot perceive it, the continents are actually moving about the Earth's surface, propelled by a process known as continental drift. Even today, Europe and America move apart at the rate of three feet every year. Volcanic eruptions on the seabed enhance the process and create new land masses from molten lava. At the dawn of the age of the dinosaurs, the whole of the world's landmass was joined together into a single supercontinent known as Pangaea. During the Jurassic period, about 200 million years ago, this great landmass began to split into two new continents known as Laurasia and Gondwana. It was on these continents that the most spectacular dinosaur species thrived. The huge sauropods, the Apatosaurus and Diplodocus, were abundant at this time. Over most of the globe, lush vegetation appears to have covered the continents, which supported the growth of these extraordinary creatures. Recent finds have suggested the existence of an enormous sauropod dinosaur, the Seismosaurus, which may have been as large as 150 feet long. By the time of the Cretaceous period, which began 145 million years ago, the outlines of the continents, which we recognise today, have begun to appear. By now, the familiar shapes of Tyrannosaurus roam the Earth. 
and huge herds of Triceratops spread out over what is now North America. Not too dissimilar in fashion to the later herds of buffalo encountered by the first white settlers in the 1830s. Whole generations of school children have been educated with the notion that dinosaurs were clumsy, badly designed creatures that were so unsuited for life that they died out almost because of their own terminal stupidity. It provides a nice line for cartoonists, but is it really true to picture them as being so massively unsuccessful by comparison to us humans? Some of the evidence would undoubtedly seem to point the other way. Well, like all rumours, there's always an element of truth in anything. Um, it's true that if you look at the majority of dinosaurs, or, or at least some of the dinosaurs, that some are stupendously large. Um, there are examples like Diplodocus, a very well-known North American dinosaur. That's somewhere in the region of 80 to 90 feet in length. It's a huge creature. If you look at the size of its head, then the head is only about two feet long, and inside that head there's a relatively small brain. So it's not unreasonable to think that by comparison to ourselves, who have huge brains, really disproportionate in terms of our body size, that these animals therefore must be very stupid because their brains are very small. Because the dinosaurs are widely known to become extinct, the popular belief that they were therefore inefficient life forms has gained currency. However, if we consider the span of time for which they held sway to the length of time humans have dominated the Earth, we may have to revise some of those sneering feelings of superiority. If the whole span of time since the beginning of the Earth is represented by the height of the Eiffel Tower, the first life appears at just above the height of the first landing. But it is very simple life indeed, plankton and algae mostly. We have a long wait of 3,000 million years, or almost to the top of the tower, before the first fish appear in the seas. The reign of the dinosaurs occupies some 180 million years or most of the mass at the top of the tower. There is then a break equivalent to the rest of the mast while the larger mammals evolve, and the 64 million years of the age of mammals passes. Finally comes the age of man, so small and insignificant by comparison to any of the other stages, that our slice of the history of the Earth is equivalent only to half the button on top of the flagpole at the very top of the tower. So by comparison with us, the dinosaurs were long-lived and spectacularly successful life forms. With the way we have managed to mishandle the planet in the short space of time we've been around, who would bet any money on us having a reign as long as them? Maybe it's us who are the stupid ones. When the first sauropod remains were discovered and analysed, it very quickly emerged that the size of the head, and therefore the brain, of, say, a patasaurus, in relation to the rest of its body, was very small. This may have been the original source of the belief that all dinosaurs were dull and stupid animals. This popular view was further strengthened by the work of O.C. Marsh, who helped excavate the first complete stegosaurus skeletons in the USA during the 1870s and 1880s. In relation to its size, the stegosaurus possessed a very small head indeed, and one of the skulls was sufficiently well preserved to allow Marsh to measure the size of the brain cavity. For an animal, Measuring in excess of 20 feet, to possess a brain the size of a plum was a revelation which quickly gained currency with the public and soon became fixed in the popular imagination. This is actually the, uh, <clears throat> the brain case of a, of a brand new dinosaur. It's um, some, a fossil skull, or part of a fossil skull, that was discovered on the Isle of Wight in um, southern England. And uh, this appeared like a nondescript lump of stone that was washed up on the seashore and was collected by a, a man called David Cooper, who's a noted collector. And he cleaned this and then had it cut down the middle and it revealed on the inside this beautiful um, prepared area, which is in fact the brain cavity of an armoured dinosaur. So we can tell the structure and form of the brains of dinosaurs with some degree of accuracy because we can take moulds of this and look at exactly how the brain was built to get some idea of its relative intelligence and of, of the 
sophistication of the animal as a whole. The Stegosaurus began to represent all dinosaurs in the public eye. Slow, clumsy and indescribably dense. Shortly afterwards, two more advances were made in the study of Stegosaurus remains. Firstly, it was discovered that the Stegosaurus had an enlarged cavity where the spinal cord passed the hips. This was initially thought to be evidence of a second brain in the tail. Soon, the popular perception grew that dinosaurs were so stupid they needed two brains, even to coordinate the front and back of their bodies. In actual fact, the cavity was more likely to be a kind of relay station or even a store of fat. But by then, the damage had been done. The public, for most of the century, have viewed dinosaurs as terminally stupid. The second major discovery was that Stegosaurus had become extinct about 140 million years ago, possibly replaced by the Ankylosaurus, themselves an ungainly and uninspiring life form. This was the final nail in the coffin. From now on, Stegosaurus and every other dinosaur was dull, stupid and prone to extinction replaced by the most oddball life forms around. Most dinosaur species only lasted just a few million years. Uh, for instance, the amount of time between us and Tyrannosaurus rex is the same amount of time between Tyrannosaurus rex and Stegosaurus, about 65 million years. So most of the dinosaurs, in fact, 99% of all the dinosaurs were already extinct by the uh, time the asteroid or comet hit. T-Rex never saw a Stegosaurus. In fact, T-Rex might have walked on the fossils of Stegosaurus. In addition to the notion that dinosaurs were stupid and dull, the enormous size of some species presented other problems for biologists at the turn of the century, and a variety of theories were postulated as to the real nature of the dinosaurs. An idea that gained currency was that the dinosaurs were cold-blooded, in the same manner as modern reptiles. Much of the popular view of the dinosaurs, current up till recently, stem from the comparison of dinosaurs with modern reptiles. The work of American paleobiologist Dr. Bakker has undoubtedly gone a long way towards changing, or at least challenging, these attitudes. The popular belief was that as modern reptiles are cold-blooded and lay eggs, dinosaurs lay eggs and were therefore cold-blooded. Physiological comparisons of dinosaur bone metabolisms between modern reptiles and mammals appears to confirm Backer's notion that dinosaurs are much more closely related to mammals. With most cold-blooded animals, um, they could not have sustained activity for a very long amount of time. And if you're a predator, especially a large predator, this would have been uh, not very adaptive at all. So it's more than likely that in order to maintain just the high level of aerobic activity necessary to go kill things, they would have to have been somewhat warm-blooded. Backer also looked at the structure of dinosaur musculature and came to the conclusion that these were not the characteristics of creatures who could move quickly only in short bursts like modern reptiles. Modern reptiles rely on the sun for energy and become sluggish in cold weather. Nor do they actively hunt in search of prey preferring to lie in wait, catching food by an explosive burst of energy. Backer argued that dinosaur carnivores were, in short, running and hunting machines, capable of speeds up to 30 miles per hour, rather than simply scavengers or stealers of others' prey, as has previously been suggested. Well, pack behaviour is always a lot more efficient than a solitary hunter. You're uh, sort of doubling the chance of getting a good kill and lessening the chance of getting injured yourself. And plus, once you uh, bring down something on a more regular basis, then uh, you'll be a healthy animal besides. They were designed to move quickly and needed to do so over extended periods. They could operate like this because they were warm-blooded, unlike reptiles, who must conserve energy for a single explosive burst. It's hardly surprising that not everyone you meet can give you a definition of a dinosaur. But it comes as a profound shock to many people to find that some of their favourite prehistoric creatures are not dinosaurs at all. They are just that, prehistoric creatures and no more. Scientists have a very strict definition of what is and what isn't a dinosaur. One creature that's excluded is our old friend, the pterodactyl, star of stage, screen, and favourite dinosaur of many. 
The sad news is, he isn't a dinosaur at all. Dinosaurs seem to be quite close relatives of the flying reptiles. And if you look in detail at the anatomy of their legs and the way their bodies are composed, then there does seem to be a strong kinship between the flying reptiles and the dinosaurs. They're not very close, but they're close enough to have a lot of similarities in them. There are four key characteristics which define dinosaurs, and the Taenodons are disqualified on the first count. The first feature of dinosaurs is, one, they only lived on land. All flying reptiles are therefore excluded, which is a bit of a pity, because that excludes the brilliant Quetzalcoatlus, the largest creature ever to fly. It was as big as a stuck a dive bomber. Also excluded are the giant seagoing lizards, such as plesiosaurs and ichiosaurs. Well, everybody sort of feels that uh, flight evolved by what's known as the parachute down method. First you have an animal in a tree that leaps from branch to branch and then sort of glides from branch to branch and then could soar from branch to branch and pretty much uh, flapping flight came from that as a method to control the direction and speed of flight. And of course flying during the Mesozoic was a major advancement because one, it gets you off the ground away from the other dinosaurs. It gets you up high where you can get at other food sources and it means you can cover a wider territory in a similar span of time. It's much faster and more efficient than walking. The second characteristic is that all dinosaurs are reptiles. This excludes all fish who lived at the same time, birds, and the tiny mammals who were contemporaries of the dinosaurs. The third characteristic is that dinosaurs lived only in the Mesozoic era, which was from 220 million years ago to 66 million years ago. This rules out a great number of early reptiles from the Permian age, which preceded the age of the dinosaurs. The final characteristic is that to be a dinosaur, the animal in question must walk upright on pillar-like legs. This excludes crocodiles, lizards and the like, who move on legs bent at right angles to their bodies. So there we have it. Tyrannosaurs, stegosaurids, sauropods, hardrosaurs and ceratopids are all in. Poor old ternodons, plesiosaurs and every variety of giant crocodile are out. Pterosaurs arose at the same time as the dinosaurs and they lasted right to the end of the Cretaceous. There were two main groups called Rampharynchoids, which are very abundant in Europe, and then the Pterodactyloids, which are abundant worldwide. And the Pterodactyloids are pretty much the ones everybody hears about in popular books because uh, pterodactyl is the common version of the term pterodactyloid. From the days of Charles Knight, who painted these Tyrannosaurs in the 1890s, to the modern museum models on display in the 1990s, the idea of the dinosaur battle, the life and death struggle between the giant Tyrannosaurus and a huge Triceratops has provided a fascinating and exciting image. But as we have seen from our dinosaur definitions, there is rather surprisingly no mention of size as a factor in deciding what is and what isn't a dinosaur. A creature did not necessarily have to be massive to be a dinosaur. Although the public perception is very much that all dinosaurs were enormous beasts, and in reality many dinosaurs were huge creatures, there also existed some very small specimens who nonetheless managed to conform to all of our four key characteristics which qualify them as a dinosaur, regardless of size. A large per percentage of the dinosaurs were larger than humans. Um, all dinosaurs start out egg size, and so they all go through various size ranges as they grow up uh, in life. A lot of dinosaur groups evolutionary headed toward large size because size is not only the best method to be safe from other predators, but it also gets you um, higher up within a forest to get at uh, better food sources. And size is always uh, the best defense against attack from other animals. That's probably why dinosaurs, most dinosaurs were big. Although the smaller breeds do have their place, the sheer size of many of the dinosaurs is what fascinates us. So just how big were they? And which breeds could have eaten each other? Well, as for attacking a dinosaur that's basically the size of a house, I think most of uh, the predatory dinosaurs would try and go for the juveniles 
or the sick or injured dinosaurs or some dinosaur that does something stupid like leaving the herd. Uh, they would never probably attack a healthy full adult because uh, they could never pull it off, it'd be too dangerous. So they would just sort of patrol the perimeter of herds looking for um, opportunistic kills or they would just scavenge uh, carcasses. We know from some of the finds of dinosaurs we have uh, skeletons of animals that have sort of theropod teeth, meeting teeth embedded in them where they've been dismembering a carcass and just ripping it to pieces. And uh, just from looking at modern animals in the uh, Serengeti Plains and looking at their behavior, we can get some idea of what dinosaurs might have done as well. One of the most fascinating of all dinosaurs is the mighty Tyrannosaurus rex. Tyrannosaurus grew to a length of up to 46 feet. It seems to have been located almost exclusively in what is now North America. They lived in the last six million years of the age of the dinosaurs, from 70 million years ago right till the very end. Its name comes from the Greek meaning King Lizard. It must have presented a nightmare prospect hurtling down on its prey with ferocious razor-like teeth. There is also some evidence to suggest that Tyrannosaurus was not above stealing freshly killed prey from other predators or scavenging carrion. But then, who would argue with him? Standing 24 foot tall at the shoulder, he would certainly have been an imposing sight. Well, Tyrannosaurus rex probably would have had different feeding strategies depending upon what stage of life it was at. As a juvenile, just running around, you know, one or two feet high, it obviously couldn't attack any other dinosaurs, so it would probably go after mammals or insects or lizards. As it got bigger, then it could go after other juvenile dinosaurs. And finally, at the full adult size, it would either go out and kill something or scavenge kills or steal kills from other animals. It would do whatever was opportunistically best for it. Shown here from scale against the modern man and car, there is little doubt he could swiftly make a meal of the man and probably the car as well. A Tyrannosaurus rex could easily have uh, ripped up a car. I think it would have broken a lot of its teeth on the metal but it was certainly strong enough to do that. It was a tremendously powerful animal, and it was essentially designed for carrying a lot of weight high off the ground with massively powerful jaws that could probably gulp down 100, 150 pounds of meat per gulp. The often represented battle between the Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops could in all probability have taken place. They both lived at exactly the same period, in the same part of the globe, and they were fairly evenly matched in terms of weight. The Triceratops, however, was not a meat-eater and would therefore tangle with the Tyrannosaurus, only in self-defence. The likely method of self-defence for the Apatosaurus consisted merely of being very, very big, 70 foot long. Even Apatosaurus, however, pales by comparison with the latest findings, of a new creature discovered in Utah named the Seismosaurus, a real monster at up to 150 foot long. It gains its name from the way the Earth must have trembled as it moved. Well, new finds are made uh, every summer all around the world, and eventually if you wait long enough, you'll find exactly what you either want to find or some big surprise that you weren't expecting to find. That's why most paleontologists have stopped saying things like, the most, the biggest, the fastest, the largest. Uh, we, it's safer not to say anything. At the other end of the scale for size lay the comparatively tiny Demonicus, almost exactly the same size as a man, who probably hunted in packs to bring down its larger prey. Smaller still was the Velociraptor, a fast-moving predator who lived towards the end of the Cretaceous period. It's interesting to compare the three-foot-tall Velociraptor with a 20-foot-tall Tyrannosaurus, who lived at the same time. It's just as well Velociraptor means speedy predator. He probably needed to be to avoid the competition. Going smaller still, we come to Comsognathus, a genuinely tiny dinosaur, measuring only one foot tall and little more than two feet long. Very light, weighing little more than a chicken. They probably relied on speed for defence and for hunting the smaller rodents and insects on which it preyed. It's um, no more than about 70 centimetres long in this example here. It's small, it has extremely thin legs, which means uh, that it was a very fast runner. It has a long counterbalancing tail, so it ran only on its back legs, 
and used its front legs for grasping with. It has a skull, which is a little bit crushed in the specimen, but it has very large eyes, long, long teeth, sharp teeth, and a large brain case. One of the earliest carnivores is represented by Dilophosaurus. These creatures carried a crest on their heads. As no record of skin colouring exists in the fossil record, the colouring of such attributes is conjectural. But based upon the crests of monkeys and birds, which are used for both sounds and in display, as this probably was, a bright and vivid hue is not altogether improbable. The arguments really are to what extent would you expect them to be colourful? And I would expect them to be colourful to some extent. I don't know what colours they were. Um, the fossil record doesn't tell us what colours the skins of dinosaurs were. We do have skin impressions. The skin of the animal was, was um, rather scaly, rather small scales in different parts of the body. Um, but they don't give us the impression of the actual colours. The, col the chemicals that provide the colour in the skin of these creatures is, um, is not preserved as fossil material. It has been suggested that despite its size and fierce appearance, Dilophosaurus was a scavenger rather than a hunter, as the long, thin jaws looked totally unsuited to the strains and stresses generated by catching and holding a struggling prey. Pachycephalosaurus had a highly developed dome-shaped head, which may have been used rather like deer antlers in displays of headbutting during courtship, not unlike modern sheep or goats. The hardrosaurids may have used their unusual crests to make sounds and call to each other across the landscape of the late Cretaceous period. And at 12 feet high and 30 feet long, they were certainly not unsuccessful life forms. Neither were the iguanodons, who inhabited the late Jurassic period and in some form or other, almost the whole of the Cretaceous. Growing to a height of some 10 feet, in the case of Camptosaurus, they probably existed on a diet of ferns and pine trees. Finally, in this brief canter through some of the main dinosaur species, we come to the unfortunate stegosaurs, source of many of the dinosaur myths. At 10 feet high and 24 foot in length, they were clearly formidable creatures, and their span of existence, some 12 million years of the late Jurassic period, is not altogether a failure either. So far, we've existed for 100,000 years on the planet, 11,900,000 less than our friend the stegosaurs. The image of dinosaurs which has been fostered over the years is of solitary beasts lumbering through the bleak landscape, devoid of contact with other creatures, only dimly aware of the world around them. Once again, the simple and often misleading process of studying modern reptiles, then applying the findings directly to the dinosaurs, may have been at the root of the myth. Until very recently, school children were taught that all dinosaurs simply laid their eggs and left the nest. The young would then hatch and be left to fend for themselves. This is generally the case with modern reptiles. And the argument went that as dinosaurs were reptiles, they must have behaved as modern reptiles do. The dinosaurs therefore hatched unattended and were left to fend for themselves in an unforgiving world. Well, dinosaur nests have been known since the 1920s. And we know that dinosaurs uh, laid their eggs in nests, just like birds do. And we know that there are, where we have intact nesting sites, we know there are thousands of dinosaur eggs. And generally, the juveniles are so small that they would not be able to feed on the larger bushes or trees that the adults can. So it's probable that the parents brought food to the nesting sites, and they helped rear the young for a while. Uh, because most of the dinosaur skeletons found are of the adult size range, we expect that there was a tremendous amount of juvenile mortality because every baby dinosaur is essentially its own sort of meals on wheels, and that's exactly what the predators would want. Then, in 1978, Dr. John Horner of the Museum of the Rockies made a find of enormous significance. Some discoveries were made in Montana in the early 1970s, late, late 1960s, um, by Jack Horner and his colleagues. 
Um, these um, were again of egg shells and egg remains, and these showed that the sophistication of behaviour was really quite remarkable in these things, because um, what he was able to discover was that not only could he find nests with, with um, eggshell remains, and also little embryonic or partially um, grown dinosaurs, but he was able to build up through the structure of the nest and through looking very carefully at the, the arrangements of the embryos and of the shell fragments, that what we have here is actually um, a colonial nest site, a site that's inhabited by large numbers of these duck-billed dinosaurs, and that the nests themselves are very carefully constructed like sort of mini volcanoes, be it about six feet across, and the nests themselves were lined with vegetation, and the eggs were laid in the vegetation and kept warm by the rotting of the vegetation as the, the eggs grew. When the hatchlings emerged, they didn't scamper away from the nest and make their own way of life. They actually stayed confined within the nest and were actually brought food by the parents. And there's ev fossil evidence to suggest that they stayed in the nest and were fed rather like a, you know, a, a young baby bird does. It's brought food by its, its parents. And only when the, the, the young dinosaurs had grown to a sufficiently large size to be able to make their own way of life would they then emerge from the nest and, and leave. This led Dr Horner to give them the name Myosaura, from the Greek meaning good mother lizard. Another piece of compelling, if controversial, evidence for the existence of nurturing behaviour came from the existence of what Dr Horner was later to call the cute factor. Modern reptiles who fend for themselves from birth, such as snakes and crocodiles, are miniature versions of the fully grown animals from the moment they appear from their egg. On the other hand, the young of animals who rear their offspring themselves tend to have offspring with marked baby features, large eyes, small noses and underdeveloped limbs, the cute features which we all love in our own babies. It is this cute factor which makes us want to love little puppies and kittens. And the young Myosaurus definitely had the cute factor. A further dent in the accepted view of dinosaur mythology came with the first firm evidence from the fossil record to support the view that many dinosaurs were not solo wanderers as they have traditionally been depicted. Some species at least had developed herd instincts. Well, the evidence for pack behavior can be found in two different areas. One is where you have a series of footprints, because when it rains on mud before it dries out, there's only a window of a few hours when you can form a nice footprint before it hardens up. So if you get lots of footprints all heading off in the same direction, all the same size, you can reasonably infer that that was either a pack or a herd of animals. The other thing is that we find lots of these meat eaters all together in the same quarry. And there's also the inference that if you have meat eaters of a certain size like Deinonychus attacking a much larger animal like Tenontosaurus or something else, they would have had to have sort of cooperation in order to kill it. At Dinosaur Park in Alberta, Canada, the fossilized remains of 80 small ceratopids were found. They had drowned together in the process of crossing a swollen river. In 1984, Another discovery by Dr. Horner provided further evidence for the existence of dinosaur heads. The bodies of at least 10,000 myosaurs were discovered together, clearly the victims of a natural disaster such as a volcanic eruption. What we had here was a major dinosaur herd, captured as in life. Suddenly, after 180 million years of dominance, the dinosaurs abruptly ceased to exist. A number of theories have been proposed to explain this strange event. People have pointed to the curious forms of Hardrosaurus and Pachycephalosaurs as examples of what they claim was a genetic weakness. They argued that these bizarre appearances were evidence of a degeneration in the dinosaur genes after such a long reign which caused hormonal abnormalities and eventual extinction. In actual fact, many of these apparently strange attributes actually served a definite purpose which helped the animals in their lives, and they were certainly not the cause of extinction. 
other theories advanced were more plausible and concerned new and deadly plagues, like the Black Death, which caused the huge human mortality of the 14th and 15th centuries. But plagues are generally specific only to one species, not entire groups of separate animals. And besides, no real evidence has ever been discovered. Similarly, the rise of small egg-stealing predators capable of wiping out the entire dinosaur population have also been suggested, again, without any real evidence. What the fossil record does support, however, is the possibility that dinosaurs may have been killed off over a very short space of time by a natural event, or alternatively, over a longer period by the effects of climatic change. Possibly even by a combination of both. But there is a consensus that the dinosaurs were the clear ancestors of our modern birds, and as such, they live on in them. Every time we see a robin or a seagull, we see a glimpse of dinosaur. This is uh, the skeleton on a plaster cast um, preparation like this of this creature called Archaeopteryx. Now, this is a spectacularly important find because not only do you find the, the complete skeleton of this creature, and you can see the tail, the tail bones here, the back legs, the wings or front legs splayed out here, and the neck with the head curled back over the back of the, arched over the back of the animal. But, and you may only just be able to get a vague impression of this, there is also preserved around the skeleton um, the impressions of the tail feathers here, on either side of the tail. You can see these very fine impressions here, which if you look under the microscope are in fact detailed, very, very feather-like impressions. And they're also found around either side of the wings here. So you've got the whole animal covered in feathers. Uh, what this is, is as far as we're concerned, one of the earliest known birds. Despite the links with the birds of today, the really spectacular creatures of the dinosaur age disappeared rapidly and completely 66 million years ago. There is some evidence to support the theory that the Earth was struck by a huge meteorite right at the end of the Cretaceous period, precisely the time at which dinosaur extinction took place. The Yucatan Peninsula off the coast of Mexico has been identified as the most likely site of impact. This event is t now tied into the notion that there was a huge meteorite that um, plunged into the surface of the Earth, caused what is in effect a nuclear winter scenario, and that is it created lots of dust and, and water vapour, which would have shrouded, shrouded the Earth, causing it to go very dark and cold and very unpleasant for a period of time, which would have made a lot of animals go extinct, not just dinosaurs, but a whole range of other creatures. There is certainly enough evidence in the fossil record to support the strong possibility of a catastrophic event such as a meteor strike. But the suddenness and completeness of this death by darkness theory has been challenged by other scientists. They assert that the dinosaurs died out not overnight, but over a comparatively long period of, say, 50,000 years. They argue that it was a combination of a changing climate increased volcanic activity, producing both periodic bouts of darkness and coldness, and a changing habitat, which were the factors which finally did for the dinosaurs. The asteroid theory is certainly the most popular theory, and most paleontologists are willing to concede that an asteroid or comet did hit the Earth at the end of the age of dinosaurs. But the controversy is, surrounds the timing of the event. Did the asteroid hit when dinosaurs were still fully diverse or did it hit after their decline or was it the coup de grace that knocked off the last species or did it even hit after the dinosaurs were already extinct? We can't really tie down the exact time of dinosaur extinction where you get the last fossils and the layer in which the asteroid hit. Uh, many people believe that the earth was full of dinosaurs at the time and that they all went out in a single night. But toward the end of the Cretaceous, uh, you were probably down to less than a dozen species of dinosaurs. As the world grew colder and volcanic activity made the periods of intense darkness more and more frequent, only the small and well-adapted mammals and birds survived an increasingly inhospitable world, which could no longer support a 30-ton plant eater, adapted to a constantly warm climate. With its prey gone, it was not long before Tyrannosaurus rex 
followed the others into extinction. The idea of these majestic creatures slowly slipping off the world's stage in an age of gathering cold and darkness is a bleak and unhappy vision. But the debate continues and new evidence is continually coming to light. Perhaps someday we'll have the definitive answer. Well, bringing dinosaurs back through recombinant DNA is something paleontologists would like to see, but it probably won't happen because first you need to get a complete sequence of dinosaur DNA, which is highly unlikely. You'd have to know in advance how many chromosomes there are in which order the DNA has to be in. Um, and to get fossilization of that kind over, you know, a 65 million year gap is uh, pretty unrealistic. But uh, reptile blood does have DNA in a nucleus. So it's theoretically possible, but not likely to happen, even though I want it to happen. For the time being, it's just one more fascinating area of debate about this most fascinating of all periods. It may well have ended in darkness and gloom, but the age of the dinosaurs contains some incredible creatures which bring wonder and excitement to light up our modern lives. 65 million years after the last one walked the earth.